we just did a routine phone follow-up and this poor lady who'd been having pain attacks for 20 to 25 years um, you know couldn't even walk outside in the winter because of the cold air blowing on her face is is now pain-free this is the James cancer free world podcast I'm Steve Wartenberg and today I have two guests Evan Thomas a James radiation oncology specialist and Brian Dahm, a neurosurgeon. Together, they treat patients using something called functional radio surgery. It's a high-tech way to use radiation to treat a wide range of neurological conditions, sometimes instead of surgery, and often to improve the quality of life and reduce the pain of their patients here at the James and the Wexner. Welcome, Evan and Brian, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. So I always like to start off and get a little background of our guests. And since we have two guests, maybe we'll shorten it a little. So Evan, we'll start with you. And what was either in your, your just your life in general or med school or, or whatever that got you to be uh, a radiation specialist? Yeah, sure. So um, I, uh, I have a background in engineering. That's what I studied in uh, undergrad and graduate school, including nuclear engineering. And I really wanted a way to parlay that into taking care of patients. So radiation oncology was a natural fit. Um, and we, um, most radiation oncologists use radiation to treat cancer patients. And uh, I do that as well. But um, I, uh, I have a love and a passion for using radiation to help uh, patients, not just with tumors that need to be treated, but also um, also with other conditions as well. And, um, you know, having had a few family members with cancer, I think maybe helped push me in this direction. But, um, but I found my calling uh, along the way using radiation for other indications as well. Yeah, I think in just talking to you guys briefly before we started, I think I'm going to learn a lot about how radiation is used for things other than treating cancer, because you guys do a lot of that. So I can't wait to learn that. And Brian, the same question. What got you into being a neurosurgeon? Yeah, I was always interested in you know, the nervous system, how it functioned, and then uh, you know, how, what can we do to change and modulate how it works. Um, so I was always kind of drawn to, in medicine, the neurological side of things, and then surgery in particular, so, so kind of the, the melding of the two together <laughs> with neurosurgery. Um, and in particular, it was uh, you know, right around the time I was in med school, there was a, a big study that came out with uh, deep brain stimulation therapy for treatment-resistant psychiatric conditions, and read about the study and then really kind of got interested in, in, in psychiatric treatments using neurosurgical procedures. And that really kind of pushed me and, and drove me into the field of, of neurosurgery. Um, ultimately ended up becoming a functional neurosurgeon, which is, you know, where we do things like deep brain stimulation therapy, you know, combination procedures like uh, with, with Evan. Hey, it's fascinating. I think there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's, uh, Definitely excited to have a partner like Evan here that's that's interested in, in trying to learn more about this stuff and, and um, really understand it and, and, and push it and be a leader in the world as far as treating these types of conditions. Well, good. I like that you mentioned that you are partners because that's what I want to understand more fully because I think your partnership and because you have different backgrounds and different specialties will help me and our, our listeners understand functional radiation radio surgery so using your partnership and what each of you do kind of walk us through maybe the history of radio surgery how it started and and what the different ways that you you use it now so who would like to start <laughs> oh well if you don't mind this is a this is a topic i i love the history of of radio surgery so i'll go ahead i'll jump right in all and right then, this uh, this is evan evan will give us the the history lesson thank you yeah so um uh the radio surgery uh first before i jump into the history for the listeners is uh, a method of delivering radiation to extreme focal targets within the brain so someone may have a relative that's undergone breast cancer and uh, in in a breast cancer treatment we might be treating the entirety of the breast over many weeks to a large volume 
In contrast to that, radio surgery, we're really talking about very focal treatments with uh, even sub-millimeter level precision that allows us to target uh, very tiny structures within the brain. And um, it was actually developed by a neurosurgeon uh, many years ago, um, in the, in, in really in the early 60s. And the technology was kind of honed throughout multiple devices. One device name is a gamma knife. Another device name is a cyber knife. Here at, uh, at the James, we have uh, three machines called the Edge and also a gamma knife that we do our radio surgery on. But really, all of these devices uh, deliver focal radiate, can deliver focal radiation to small targets. And as we've learned more about the brain, we've gotten better and better imaging. We can actually see networks within the brain uh, that allow us to target and modulate function within those networks. And that's initially what radio surgery was designed to do. And we use it for tumors now, but uh, Brian and I are, are really looking to kind of take radio surgery back to its roots and really um, leverage better imaging and help patients with conditions that aren't responding to their medicines, like tremor, like pain, um, and like psychiatric conditions. So you said bring it back to its roots. So originally radio surgery was used for those things, then it evolved to treat tumors, and now you're bringing it back to combine that. That's exactly correct. And um, it's, it's kind of fascinating in that uh, now um, here at the James, you know, we see a tremendous number of cancer patients who, uh, you know, really struggle with, with managing their pain despite, um, despite large amounts of medication. So uh, instead of taking radio surgery and necessarily treating their tumors, we, it, we find that it may be more beneficial to use it to modulate their brain function uh, to help them tolerate their pain better. I think what, yeah, what Evan said, you know, was, was key that, uh, we're going back to the roots, but I think now if you look at where we are in 2023, you know, we've had some of this technology for a little while now, but, uh, it's almost like stereotactic radio surgery when it was invented was, was, it was too early. Um, like now that we have the imaging capabilities, we can, we can see network connections. We can understand what's abnormal. We can identify changes afterwards as well. So it's not so much going forward. You know, we're going to be treating the, the, the pain conditions or the, the psychiatric condition, but we can almost even have the ability to see what's kind of the abnormal part. Uh, we have the imaging capabilities to do that now. And then we can, we can modulate areas or selectively go after you know parts of those abnormal connect you know connections and networks and, and and make some changes so originally you had the radiation technology but you didn't have the imaging to allow you to be as precise as you can now be and so that the imaging has caught up to the radiation technology yeah. so how and this is what I I don't fully understand how when you use this radiation, on a patient, how deep and how precise can you get inside someone's brain? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And um, uh, we actually do for all of our radiation treatments, um, regular conventional radiation and these stereotactic radio surgery treatments, we do really robust quality assurance and we have a team of medical physicists that help us keep our machines tuned to sub-millimeter level precision. And so um, we've done studies to look at, you know, end to end from imaging all the way to the delivery of the treatment. How accurate are these treatments? And for our gamma knife, they're on the order of 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 millimeters. And on our other, our linear accelerators, uh, on the order of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 millimeters. So it truly is sub-millimeter level precision of these, these treatments. Just because I don't fully understand millimeters, you're talking about like a hair? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I guess, you know, for, for the listeners, uh, if uh, you, um, an inch is, is two and a half centimeters, and a centimeter is 10 millimeters, so we're talking about precision on the order of half of one twenty-fifth of an inch. Wow. And how far into the brain can you go that a accurately? Because I know sometimes tumors and other things in the brain, they say they're so far in bed that they're inoperable. 
Uh, yeah, so r really anywhere, Brian and I can go anywhere in the brain that we want to go, that we need to go, where the imaging, you know, tells us that we need to treat for a particular condition. Okay, so to, to help me understand this, maybe some examples of some recent, recent patients and sort of what was wrong with them and, and how you guys came up, came up with a plan and, and how it worked. Yeah, Brian? Uh, well, the most recent one we did was a, a lady who suffers from something called trigeminal neuralgia. Um, it's a very painful pain condition of the face. Um, and there are multiple different treatment strategies for it. Some are open surgery. Some are you can use a needle. You go in, you can burn part of the nerves. And one option that's been around for a long time has been stereotactic radio surgery. Uh, so we treated this lady... Was it a week ago, two weeks ago now? Yeah, a couple, a few weeks ago now. And then uh, we just found out yesterday, she said since post-op day two, post-treatment day two, she's been pain-free. Yeah. Um, so what was causing her pain? We don't precisely know. We, you know. we think it's a vessel of some sort, but it, yeah. it may not always be the case. But there could be other things. I think we think in this lady, it probably was a vessel. Yeah. When we, when we looked at her nerve... It looked, at least from the MRI, what we could see, like this particular vessel that's off in the culprit was almost pushing her nerve outward. Um, but um, in any case, um, you know, we just did a routine phone follow-up, and this poor lady who had been having pain attacks for 20 to 25 years, um, you know, couldn't even walk outside in the winter because of the cold air blowing on her face is, is now pain-free. The treatment does, uh, you know, does render pain-free 80 to 90 percent of people, uh, you know, at uh, at years out. And the treatment for her was radiation beams. It was. It was invisible, invisible gamma rays, um, you know, from our gamma knife machine, um, and it was uh, non-invasive. She didn't have to get cut open or anything like that. Her job was um, essentially just to lie there for about an hour and a half. And, uh, and relax, and uh, then go home. So why did it take 20 years <laughs> for her to find the right doctors? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So I think one thing that um, um, you know, I struggle with, and I think Brian struggles with, is that um, uh, a lot of people and a lot of physicians um, are kind of not aware of some yeah, of the Yeah, that's what I thought you were going to say. They the don't know what you do. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, so uh, this lady had a, had this diagnosis for many years, um, and her her primary care doctors probably tried her on medications, but um, the average primary care doctor doesn't know um, doesn't know what stereotactic radio surgery is, much less what it can do. So that's why I think um, you know programs like this that help us build outreach and awareness are, are really helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I've talked to other doctors with, with certain kinds of screenings and other things that it's educating primary care physicians about new technologies that are available. And since we want to educate them on stereotactic radiology, what does that word stereotactic mean? So stereotactic, stereotaxy is really... Uh, say, say it again? Did I say it wrong? No, stereotactic. Okay. Stereotaxy, just another phrase we use is... Uh, it's it's essentially using your X Y Z coordinates uh, to to locate structures inside the head. Um, so the original developments of them were with uh, frames. Um, so the you know, Evan mentioned earlier the initial stereotactic radio surgery device that was made was made by a guy named Lars Lexell. We still use the Lexell frame. It's what we use for all of our um, gamma knife procedures where we put patients in frames. It's what we use for all of our deep brain stimulation procedures. It's 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 the same frame. <laughs> so I've seen that they build a frame for each patient whose their head fits in it exactly so you can then precisely do the beams. There's two different yeah, right. I can. Yeah, so so what you're talking about is actually a um, is actually a, a mask. So there's two ways oh, we can do okay. radio surgery. One kind of the old classic way is we we put people in in one of these uh, so-called stereotactic frames which gives us a, a frame of reference for applying imaging coordinates to within the brain. In the old days before MRIs um, uh, and, and high-resolution CT scans, if a surgeon needed to know where to put something in the brain, um, he couldn't look at an image and overlay it on the patient's head because that wasn't around yet. So uh, 
some very clever neurosurgeons developed a frame of reference um, that would be in relation to this, this patient being in a frame. And so that's how they would know to get where they needed to go within the brain. Nowadays, we have much better imaging than they did. And uh, so in some situations, uh, rather than put people in the frame to define these reference coordinates, we can just put them in a more comfortable mask um, that fits the contours of their head and, um, and then overlay images for that space. So we have when you say overlay images, is it, I think I've seen that too. It's like lights on the patient's head that it's like a map. Is that what I'm thinking? It's of? like you do, so we could take the MRI scan that has our target, our planned target, uh, whether it's, you know, some sort of SRS lesion and then something with a frame of reference. It can be a CT scan. Sometimes it's a CT scan with someone with one of those frames around their head and we can merge those images together. And so once we have that, we know where the patient's head is because we know the bony anatomy or we know where the frame is in relationship to the bony anatomy. And then all that's merged the MRI scan. So then we uh, know where, yeah, if we want to hit a, a certain spot on that MRI scan, we don't know how to get there unless we have some sort of registration to, to put it to. So it could be bone, it could be the frame, but once we're able to merge those two together and verify that those those overlay and those are exact, you know, exactly the same. Then the software that we have that can tell us how to get to that spot is is gonna is gonna go there. So we we do that with the so the computers match it up. That's right. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, Evan and Brian will fill us in on a few more ways radio surgery is helping their patients. You didn't choose cancer, but you can choose where to treat it. And when you choose the James at Ohio State, you're picking a team of experts who understand there is no routine cancer. You're opting for care from a highly specialized team dedicated to treating one type of cancer, yours. A team that studies the unique makeup of your disease to develop a personalized treatment plan. You're choosing our region's only comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Where more than 1,700 scientists are working on new treatments and new hope for every form of cancer. At the James, you're making the choice to have the most advanced treatments, many of which were developed right here. And you're choosing access to the James world-class clinical trials, dedicated support services, and an unmatched survivorship program to support your life after cancer treatment. You didn't choose cancer, but the choice of where to treat it is clear. We're back with Evan Thomas and Brian Dahm, and we're talking about radio surgery. And again, I think it's really helpful to understand this technique by giving us an example of how you use it. So, Brian, what's what's another way you're you're using radio surgery? So, uh, in, in, in the realm of treatments for pain, cancer pain, uh, there's a number of, of ablative operations that, that we do as neurosurgeons. Um, one of them are, uh, excuse me, one of them is uh, cingulotomy. So we actually can make a very small hole, uh, just a few millimeters wide, uh, stick a probe in, inside the brain in an area called the cingula gyrus, and we can burn that tissue and ablate that tissue. A blade, um, a blade of means burning. Means right? burn, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, all these techniques can all be used using radio surgery as well. So, yeah, differences with surgical techniques is even though we're making a small hole, is we still have to make an incision. We're still passing something through the brain. So there's a chance for complications related to that, particularly in patients with cancer. You know, they may not have a, a great immune system from their treatment. They may have low, you know, platelet levels. You'd be worried about bleeding uh, from from passing probes, things like they that. Have to be on blood thinners. Some, yeah, yeah, they may have to be on blood thinners. Um, so cingulotomies, thalamotomies. These are some procedures that we we sometimes use for ablative or burning tissue that can also be used for radio surgery to treat pain. So what tissue inside the brain is causing pain that you're able to ablate and and burn away? Yeah, so it's not necessarily the, the tissue in the brain. It's it's kind of what we were talking about before with these pathways. Uh, so, you know, how we, we can, with newer imaging techniques, we can kind of see these connections and these pathways and how they interact with each other. We can alter and we can kind of interrupt some of these pathways to try to uh, 
create an a, a improved therapeutic outcome, which in these particular cases would be pain relief. Wait, yeah. so I think I understand. So this could be pain anywhere in the body that the nerves send to the brain, so your brain identifies it a pain. You're cutting off that connection, so the pain that the patient would have felt in their leg doesn't travel to the brain anymore. That's right, yeah. So it, it could be anywhere. It could even be in the, the right big toe, <laughs> and there's <laughs> nothing else that we can do to treat that pain. We've tried everything else. Yeah, a blade of options could be, you know, that's an extreme example, but um, you know, a blade of options anywhere along that path from yeah. where that toe is, spinal nerve, spinal cord, brain stem, the, the sensory relay area in the brain, which is the thalamus, and some of these associative areas like the cingulate gyrus that can help uh, process pain. Um, these are all areas that can be targeted uh, to help kind of interrupt that, that pain network. Yeah. But this means your knowledge of an imaging of the brain and the nervous system is advanced to such a stage that you're able to identify and do this. That's correct. Which yeah. is kind of amazing. That's correct. And, um, you know, we have, uh, we have colleagues in neuroradiology as well who do some um, truly phenomenal and, uh, and, and, and fascinating work taking special sequences from MRIs and then making it easier for Brian and I to see these tracks within uh, overlain on the brain. So we know that, you know, we, we know from our anatomy that we learned in medical, medical school which pathways connect the pain fibers in the leg, for example, to the spinal cord, which runs up through the brain stem, through the thalamus into the brain. And so no, we know that network is there, and we know that if we interrupt that network, we can sometimes help patients with pain that's, that's being transmitted on that network. But uh, being able to see it on images has, has, really, has really helped us uh, take a leap forward in, in applying these treatment steps more effectively. So why, so a person has pain in their foot, their knee, their arm, does this mean you're not able to treat that pain and then that's why you just have to block the nerves or are you able to eliminate the pain at its yeah, entry so point. Yeah, so the, the patients we typically see are, are patients whose, whose pain is, um, is, is, is so advanced or, or so problematic that uh, it's, it's not able to be managed effectively with medications, whether that's anti-inflammatory pain medications or uh, opioid pay, pain medications. Um, and so people will come to us on really high doses of, of opioid medications. And so one, one thing, uh, one goal that Brian and I have when we're, when we're thinking about these patients is, um, you know, reducing the burden of the medicines they have to take as well. Because yeah, we know opioid addiction is, is not a good yeah. avenue to go down. And, and stay tuned on that. Uh, Dr. Dom, Brian, and I are, are also um, working on writing up a clinical trial to study using radiosurgery to treat patients with opioid addiction by modulating centers in the brain that we know are, are involved uh, in, ha in, in, the, in the pathophysiology of addiction itself. So the pathways in the brains, in the brain that are related to addiction, you can you're looking to modulate. Modulate. Yes. Modulate means means uh, means reduce the influence of. So we know centers of the brain in addiction um, become much more much more sensitive to and 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 needful of the stimulation that narcotics yeah. provide and the release of certain neurotransmitters. And um, we know from some previous surgical literature within the brain that certain locations, the nucleus accumbens in particular, uh, can be a target to help people with addiction. And so uh, Brian and I are, are, are investigating ways to apply radiosurgery for those patients so that there's a non-invasive uh, non-invasive treatment method to potentially help these people who've struggled and um, are, aren't able to, you know, become free of their addictions. Wow, that would be huge. And it, it, it seems to me the more you guys explain what you do, and particularly these new things you're coming up with, you guys are kind of creative and sort of, I don't know if you're like uh, Lennon McCartney, you sort of 
feed off of each other and come up with these great ideas. Is that? He's Paul. He's Paul. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like, uh, how, how does that neither work? Neither of us is Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he was the beat of, he, he couldn't, uh, okay. But, but is that true? I mean, it just sounds like you guys are just, com- you're just brainstorming and come, oh, brainstorming is a good way, way to describe it. And coming up with these kind of cool, out of the, think, out of the box thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Uh, some of the stuff's been been you know, done before in different different ways. Uh, I think the you know, like I was mentioning before, one of the big advances we have now is that we have better ways of kind of identifying things. We have better ways of tracking uh, outcomes. Um, we have better ways of maybe predicting who would be a good per- good candidate for some of these types of procedures and interventions. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're looking at interventions for pain for psychiatric conditions you're taking you know, the the worst of the worst as far as they've failed all sorts of, you know, every single medical therapy that can be thrown at them I and mean, maybe they're on we look at from a pain standpoint morphine milligram equivalents you know, you know high dose morphine milligram equivalent 90 or so has a higher risk of uh, op- opioid overdose and, and death by opioids yeah, some of these people in in, in you know, with with cancer pain, they're on hundreds of MMEs worth of opioids, um, and so we're getting involved. Oftentimes, when you know people are on IV pain meds and they can't come off it, and there's there's no other treatment options that they they know of, and a lot of times, yeah, you know, these are are people with you know they don't have great options. Their prognosis is sometimes months, maybe. Um, and they're trying to figure out how to get some of these people to hospice, uh, but they can't because they can't get them off their, their pain meds, so they have to stay in the hospital. That's when they get people like us involved that may be able to help and treat some of these pain areas to try to decrease the pain so we can reduce the number of opioids they're on and, 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 and give them a better quality of life. Yeah, yeah I, I sort of have seen that, that in the, the very last stages of someone they're in such pain, they're on, they're on so many drugs, they're just out of it, almost like coma-like for however long they're in hospice. You're saying you can turn that around and reduce the pain in other ways so the person will be more cognizant and able to communicate with their family right up to the end. Yeah, it's one of the challenges with uh, just conventional medical management for pain. If you just keep upping the opioid, yeah. you, know, you, you give them methadone, these long as- long-acting drugs, and their morphine milligram equivalents are in the hundreds, you know, you're going to have what we call systemic or, or whole body-wide side effects from that. Drowsiness, cognition, constipation, um, all these things are, are you know, they're, they're very challenging to deal with, and they're not, they're not optimal for you know, the, the, the pain management care in that particular person. Yeah, and and we we also know that people in, in, in intense pain, uh, which is often the case with cancer patients, can undergo this phenomenon called sensitization, where um, patients in nonstop pain, we give narcotic medication, so we're blocking the brain's ability to perceive that pain, but the body's still trying to tell the pain, the, the brain that it's in pain. So it will actually upregulate certain receptors within the nerves and the spine, which can actually cause the, the patient to be more sensitive to yeah. pain and then they need more narcotic medications and it's a vicious cycle. And so sometimes something beyond the medication is really necessary and, and that's, um, you know, that's where, where Dr. Dahlman and I come in. And um, I think one, uh, one, one procedure that um, has actually been around for some time, um, but is, fair, is not, very used, not used very commonly, we're looking to get off the ground. Uh, it's a procedure called a radiosurgical hypophysectomy, which is a big, long word, but it essentially means we're, we're applying stereotactic radiation to the brain's pituitary gland. And this procedure has a very interesting history that relates back to cancer. Um, in the 1950s, a pair of uh, neurosurgeons were trying to help patients with really advanced breast and prostate cancer, cancers that are driven by hormones. And so their idea was that if we, um, if we uh, surgically remove or surgically injure the pituitary gland, maybe those hormones can't drive the cancer anymore. Um, they weren't able to alter the tra- trajectory of those patients' um, cancer growth, but an interesting observation was that they became, all the patients became pain-free within days. 
And so over the years, neurosurgeons looked at other ways to do this, um, including directly injecting a chemical into the, the cavity where the pituitary gland resides. And eventually, uh, someone had the idea of, of trying this procedure with focused radiation. And um, so the, that procedure is, has been effective. It's got some published data. And there are a handful of places around the world that do it. Um, but it's just a very niche procedure um, that uh, not a lot of people are familiar with. But it's something that Brian and I are, are, are looking to make available at the James uh, for, for our cancer patients here. Wow. Uh, through a clinical trial? Yeah. So uh, ostensibly, we're going to be um, building a registry study that not just this procedure, but patients um, needing other types of uh, similarly niche procedures can all, all go on in, in hopes that, you know, we can, we can treat these people's pain and, and study their outcomes and, and make things more known to, to the field. So who are you looking for? Patients with what type of pain that radiating the pituitary gland would, would help? It's not everyone, right? So uh, it seems that people with bone-related pain uh, tend to respond best to it. Um, and, you know, with, with people with cancer have either local invasion of the bone or metastatic disease to the bone that have pain related to bone disease tend, tend to respond well. And there, there's, there's some pretty dramatic results uh, with uh, stereotactic radiosurgery more recently of, of people you know, coming off their pain meds, you know, not being able to walk, being bed bound, and then afterwards being able to get up and, you know, walk with a walker afterwards in very minimal pain. So it can be, it, it can be quite remarkable what, what can be achieved through this. Yeah. Now, this would be separate from the, whatever cancer treatment they may or may not be getting here at the James, and you would work in collaboration with the, the doctors treating their cancer? Is that correct? What? With their, with the patient's primary oncology teams. And so this is kind of an adjunct to what, um, you know, I'd say uh, another, another tool in the toolbox for the uh, phenomenal palliative care teams that we have here at the James. Um, and, um, you know, as Brian mentioned, uh, this pr particular procedure is uh, really most effective for bone pain, but we have other targets in the brain um, that uh, people with neuropathic pain um, uh, could benefit from, from treatment of as well. Ryan, I think you, uh, you, you sometimes do ablation for, for those other centers of the brain as well, correct? Yes, uh, we do. Um, yeah, the, the kind of easiest and, and yeah, least uh, invasive target from a surgical standpoint would be the cingulotomy target that we talked about before. Um, it's commonly used for, for mostly cancer-associated pain now, but it, it, there are non-cancer pain conditions that people use it for as well, and it's that treatment refractory type of pain. Um, you know, the nice thing about cingulotomies are that uh, it's it's very nonspecific, so pain can be anywhere, um, and it, it it affects that kind of processing of the pain. Uh, so we're not necessarily directly altering the pain network in that in, in, by by targeting the, the cingulate gyrus, but we're altering how the how the you, know, you how you perceive the pain and how you experience the pain. Wow, it's like we're, we, meaning you, it's like you're just really digging into and learning uh, about pain. And, and there's so much more you're going to learn and so many more things you're going to be able to do yeah. in the years to come. I mean, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, if anything you can ablate inside the head, you can do SRS too. So the, the uh, hypophos hypophysectomies are, are a perfect example of that. You know. Yeah. Surgically, say that, say, what what are they? Say that again. Hy, hy, hypothesectomy. <laughs> what what is that? That's what we were talking about with the the radio surgery to treat. Yeah. Uh, oh oh. The, yeah. The bone. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, it comes from the word hypothesis, which is uh, which is uh, an anatomic name for the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland kind of sits right below the uh, the thalamus uh, and the hypothalamus, which is where this name uh, comes okay. from. The the other thing that amazes me. And I keep hearing this over and over that collaboration here is so amazing, not just between you two, but then with the person's oncologist and then with people in labs that at a comprehensive cancer center and hospital, it's like the options for patients and the research and, and the collaborations are just just way up. And, and you guys are such a great example of that. Yeah, I think it has to be. I mean, uh, nobody is an expert in everything. Um, and you know, we treat patients as a team. 
Um, so it's always good to have you know, the James is a perfect example of multidisciplinary conferences, uh, you know, different types of treatment board. We call them boards, but they're groups where people from multiple different specialties get together and, and talk about patients and kind of what's the best treatment option or maybe what would be the next step. And then if that doesn't work, what would we do after that? But and it seems like your role with the pain management is growing and you're becoming more and more part of these discussions and meetings. Yeah, I said that that's correct. It's uh, one of the things that I've been working on for the past few years. I've been here, uh, Evan and I, since we've been partnering together with, with functional stereotactic radio surgery. Um, particularly, you know, pain is a is a very um, kind of attractive, it you know, procedure to go after, just because it affects so many people. Yeah. Um, and how much a patient's quality of life can be, you know dramatically improved i mean within hours or days after after a procedure yeah i mean well that, that's a great way to finish it up for each of you that's what you do and you work with patients to relieve their pain like that woman you talked about who was in pain for 20 years and is now pain free what's that like to be able to treat a patient and then talk to them or see them and, and know that their quality of of life has improved, and, and Evan, why don't you answer that first? You know, I, I think that's just that's just one of the the most rewarding things in medicine is is seeing a patient and knowing that you've truly made a difference for them, whether it's a patient's uh, you know uh, intractable tremor that prevents them from being able to feed themselves, and we treat that tremor, and then now the patient can feed themselves, or whether that patient had pain. Um, you know, so bad that they they couldn't they couldn't pick up their grand their grandchild and hold them. Um, being able to to help patients with that yeah. is is um, you know I, I think probably the most one of the most rewarding things I've ever experienced. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, taking an example away from the cancer side, you know, we do a lot of things on non-cancer within uh, functional neurosurgery. Um, talking about tremor. Um, who did an ultrasound ablation of the thalamus for a lady with tremor uh, two weeks ago. And uh, after the treatment, she was back in recovery. I went back to see her just to check on her, make sure things were going okay. Her family was in there with her. She's laying in bed, sitting there drinking a Diet Coke. <laughs> and Something she never could have done before. She said it probably hasn't has been 20 years since she's been able to do that. And, you know, it's, it's funny because as the patient, if, for her, as the patient being treated, if she was just sipping it like, you know, she'd been doing it her whole life, but her family members were like, I can't remember the last time I've seen her be able to do that. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty impactful how, how much you can change these people's lives. So tremor is one example, pain's another example. Um, yeah, you know, some of these psych psychiatric conditions don't have that kind of flick of a switch type thing where it just happens so quickly, but it can really make pretty profound differences in, in these people. You know, there's some with OCD that, stays in their, you know, their bedroom all day long or, uh, you know, can't function outside of like certain situations. And then you, you find out afterwards that, you know, they're, you know, they're holding a job again and they're going out and all, all these other things. Just, you know, it's, it's really makes you feel good that you're actually doing something um, and, and making a different uh, you know, impact in these people's lives. Yeah. I think Brian mentioned something that is, uh, you know, another great point that I just want to highlight about the James is, uh, and, and o the OSU Wexner Center in general is that uh, being such a large institution with such an array of specialists, is we have we have an entire assortment of tools to do these things. And having these tools, Brian mentioned ult focused ultrasound, which is another way to do ablation within the brain. Having the choice of all these tools means we get to look at each individual patient and and decide as a team which approach is optimal for which patient. And, um, you know, I, don't, I just don't think there are a whole lot of other centers around the country or even the world that have, uh, you know, the same breadth of, of technology um, uh, for us to, to wield at our disposal to help patients. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And you're, you guys are a big part of it. And thanks for sharing this. This was really fascinating. And keep up your creativity and new techniques and maybe down the road you can come back and share some of your new successes with us yeah very good thank you yeah thank you
This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur D. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.